Let's get started, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. We're still in Zad al Mustaqna', the chapter of Salah of Imam al Hajjawi, and we're dealing with the book pertaining to the funeral rites, Ahkam al Janaza. Today's section is Faslun fil Kafan, a section pertaining to the wrapping of the dead, how the dead is wrapped up for burial. So, Kafan, Takfin Lugatan, Kafan Lugatan in the language is a Taqtiya, a Taqtiya. Taqtiya is just to cover. Shar'an, technically, Ilbasul Mayyid, Tiyabul Maut. It's to cover the dead, to clothe the dead with clothing which is appropriate for burial. The author, he says in his first sentence in this section, Qawluhu yajibu takfinuhu. The author, he says, it's wajib, it's imperative, it's fard, that the kafan, the wrapping for the burial is given to the dead. So the hukum of this takfin, wajib ala al-kifaya, is wajib ala al-kifaya, meaning it's fard al-kifaya. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in the hadith, وَكَفِّنُوهُ فِي ثَوْبَيْهِ And wrap him up, make a kafan for him in his thobe, in his thobe. So, one of the scholars, he said, Shaykh al-Mushayqih, he said, حَمْلَ حَادِ الْفَرْضِ عَلَى الْكِفَايَةِ لِأَنَّهُ لَمْ يُلَاحِدْ فِي الْعَامِلِ وَإِنَّمَا لُوحِذَ فِي الْعَمَلِ He said, this is taken not to be fard al-ayn, but is rather fard al-kifaya, because in the hadith, wrap him up in his clothing, it wasn't mentioned who is to do this action. Rather, only the action itself was mentioned as a command. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't specify who is to do the action. Rather, the action itself was commanded. Therefore, that means that it's Fardul Kifaya. So if anybody does that from amongst the community, then that will lift the responsibility from the whole of the community. This is Fardul Kifaya. Question to yourselves, if there's anyone there. When might it be Fardul Ain? So we're saying that it's Fardul Kifaya. When might it be Fardul Ain to do this wrapping, to do the uh, takfin of the Mayyid? When might it move from being Fardul Kifaya to becoming Fardul Ain, Fard upon each individual or a individual? So it can move from being Fardul Kifaya to Fardul Ain if nobody else in the community can afford to buy and purchase the kafan except for one person. So that one person in the community that has the ability to act upon this fard, then for him it will be fardul ayn. Okay, because he's the only person in the community that can do so. The author he moves on and he says, قَوْلُهُ فِي مَالِهِ مُقَدَّمًا عَلَى دَيْنٍ وَغَيْرِهِ The kafan is to be purchased from the wealth that the dead person has left behind. Okay, and that is to take precedence before paying off the dead person's debts and before distributing his wealth as inheritance etc. So the kafan is to be purchased from the wealth of the dead person and we take this from the hadith in Sahih Muslim when the Prophet said regarding the person who had fallen off his naqa, fallen off his camel, okay, at Arafah, he said fi ma'in wa sidrin wa fi that wash this man, give ghusl to this man in water and sidr and then make for him a kafan, make his um, burial wrappings for him in his thobe, in his clothing. So the fact that the Prophet ﷺ said in his clothing, this alludes to that is his wealth. So the ulama, they say from this hadith, we take the point that it should be bought from his wealth and it's to be given preference over Dain. Why? Because the ulama, they say that if the person was alive and he owned nothing else except for this clothing, yet he had debts, then he wouldn't be asked to sell his clothing to pay his debts. Likewise in death, the preference is given to the clothing before having to pay off any debts. Okay? And also with regards to it being uh, a, a wajib to make the takfin, Ibn Hubayr he said, وَاتَّفَقُوا عَلَىٰ وَجُوبِ تَكْفِينِ الْمَيِّتِ وَأَنَّهُ مُقَدَّمْ عَلَىٰ دَيْنِ الْوَرَثَىٰ عَلَىٰ دَيْنِ وَالْوَرَثَىٰ That Ibn Hubayr he said, this famous Imam, he said that it's uh, it's kind of a unanimous agreement amongst the ulama, okay, that it's obligatory to make takfin of the mayyit, to make kafin of the dead person, and this takes precedence over paying the debts and over paying the wealth to those who are inheriting. And also connected to the payment regarding the money required for 
um, buying the shroud, the coffin, is also any other money which is required to be spent on the preparation of any of the burial rites, from the ghusl, from the preparation of the grave, from those who will be carrying him to the grave, etc. If money is required for those issues, then that money takes precedence before having to pay any debts which are outstanding or before having to spend the money to pay to those who are to inherit it. The author, he says, فَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ مَالٌ فَعَلَى مَنْ تَلْزَمُهُ نَفَقَتُهُ If this person, the dead person, doesn't have money from which the coffin will be bought and which the other funeral rites are paid for, then it's going to be from the one who is responsible for him. So this means that if a person has a close relative, like if a son, for example, has a father that takes care of his needs whilst he's alive, then when this son has now passed away, the father will continue to take care of his needs with regards to payment for the burial rites, for this coffin and everything else that is required. However, if the person has no close relative that can take care of his needs, then the Muslims will look to the Baytul Mal, they will look to the Muslim treasury, and the Muslim treasury will pay for his uh, funeral rites. Now, if the Muslim treasury has no money, then it's upon anybody in the community that comes to know about this issue and is able to afford to pay for the kafan and other affairs that are required for the funeral rites. The author, he says, إِلَّا زَوْجْ لَا يَلْزَمُهُ كَفْنُ إِمْرَأَتِهِ He says an exception here is that the husband doesn't have to pay for the shrouding of his wife. Okay? Now here the ulama, they are talking about in sense of a ruling's perspective. Okay? So first of all, what is the illa? What is the reason why the, uh, the husband doesn't have to pay for his wife's shrouding? They say, al-illa anna kiswatuha wajibat alayhi li ajl al-zawjiyati wa tamkinihi man al-istimta biha wa hadha qad inqata'a bil-mawt fa asbahat kal ajnabiyya The ulama, they say the illa, the reason that the husband has to take care in normal circumstances for the wife's needs financially is because he's married to her and he has a benefit from her which is that he gets to enjoy her company and he enjoys her physically however when the death comes about and they are separated from death then she becomes foreign to him and there's no more enjoyment therefore the husband doesn't have to spend on the wife anymore so this is the reasoning in terms of ahkam in terms of a fiqhi perspective so they're speaking from a uh, a fiqh perspective that the husband doesn't have to pay for the shrouding of the wife. However, with regards to yani, out of goodness and that which is expected from a husband, then a husband, of course, has to go ahead and pay for the shrouding of his wife. As a ruling, it's not incumbent upon him, it's not wajib, but it's something which is expected from him, right? From, husnul, uh, from good uh, relationships that they have. Even though she has passed away, She's his wife and it's uh, something upon him that he should take care of as long as she wasn't over the top annoying him and totally drove him crazy. Maybe in this situation he doesn't want to pay. But uh, in most circumstances, in most situations, a husband is from his goodness and good manners and his maru'ah that he should pay for the wife's shrouding. Another riwayah in the madhab, another opinion in the madhab held by Sheikh Uthaymeen and Imam Sa'adi is that the purchasing is incumbent upon the husband even after the death. Okay, so even as a fiqh ruling, in this opinion of Uthaymin and Imam Sa'adi, they say it's incumbent upon the husband that he pays for the shrouding, the takfin of the woman. The author, he says, وَيُسْتَحَبُّ تَكْفِينُ رَجُلٍ فِي ثَلَاثِ لَفَائِفَ بِيض It's recommended that a man is wrapped in three sheets which are white. This is because it's the best uh, way of shrouding a man because the Prophet ﷺ was shrouded in this manner. The Prophet ﷺ was shrouded in three sheets, in three kafan, right? Lafaif. And of course, the companions, radiallahu anhum, they would only choose for the Prophet ﷺ that which was best for him. Therefore, the ulama, they say, based upon the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was shrouded in three, then it's better, it's mustahab, more recommended that a person is shrouded in three, a man is shrouded in three sheets. However, they say that it should not be more than three sheets. This is something which is makru, something which, which is disliked.
because as we just mentioned the companions they chose for the Prophet Sallallahu three sheets and it's recommended that it be white why because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said in Ahmed and Abi Dawood uh, he said albisu min thiyabikum al bayad fa innaha min khayri thiyabikum the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said wear from your clothing white clothing for verily it is the best of your clothing wa kaffinu fiha mawtakum and also uh, shroud in it you're dead shroud in it you're dead the white clothing and the sheets that are chosen they should not be seen through they should not be uh, so thin that they can show the color of the skin okay because we're covering the awra here we're covering the dead so we need to ensure that it does it's not see through the author he says qawluhu tujammaru tajmir means that this bukhur bukhur is put on the akfan bukhur is put on the kafan on the sheets that the person is going to be shrouded in in al awsat of Ibn Mundir, he said, Ibn Mundir, this great Imam, he said, everybody that we have memorized from amongst the people of knowledge, they say that it's recommended that the thobe, that the clothing, the kafan, is to uh, jammar, has, has ijmar, meaning bakhur is made and put on that clothing. Many of the fuqaha, they said that when you put this bakhur, this smoke, uh, which is uh, perfumed, they say that the clothing, the sheets should slightly be wet. And the reason they say the sheets should slightly be wet is so that it can retain, uh, the sheets will retain the smell, the perfume smell, which comes from the bakhur, okay? As mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil and others. The author, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said, ثُمَّ تُبْسَتُونَ بَعْضُهَا فَوْقَ بَعْضُ once you have put bakhur on the sheets, okay, the three of them, then they are laid out on the ground. They are laid out on the ground, one on top of the other. And the first sheet which is to put on, be put on the ground, it should be the best one in terms of quality. Why should be the first sheet which is laid on the ground be the best one in terms of quality? Question to yourselves. The first shroud from amongst the three which is put on the ground should be the best. Why? Okay, the reason the ulama they say this is because the lowest sheet, the one which is on the first to be put on the ground, that when you finish the wrapping from these three sheets, it will end up being the one which is apparent, the one which is visible. Okay, so obviously, like when the person lives is alive, uh, the apparent clothing, the outer clothing, is that which is the best, better than that which is worn underneath. Likewise, the first sheet which is laid on the ground, which will end up being the apparent clothing, the outer garment for the dead, then that should be the best. The author, he says, وَيُجْعَلُ الْحَنُوتِ فِيهَا فِيمَا بَيْنَهَا وَيُجْعَلُ الْحَنُوتِ فِيمَا بَيْنَهَا That hanut is to be put between the sheets. Okay, hanut is a mixture of perfume which is uh, prepared for the dead body, for the burial of the dead body. It has a very strong smell which expels vermin. It prevents vermin from approaching the body. The author, he says, and then the body is to be taken and placed upon these three sheets. Why the body is placed upon the three sheets on the back rather than the side? Because it's easier to wrap. And before the body is wrapped in these three sheets, once it's placed on the shroud, then some cotton is to be taken and the hanout, that perfume which is mixed for the dead, is to be placed on the cotton, a lot of it, and then put between um, the rear end of the dead person, put between the area of the bottom of the dead person. The reason this is, is that if the body is moved, when it is moved, if anything was to come out, it will help prevent that from spreading this cotton, and also that strong smell of the hanout, of the perfumes, would repel any smell whilst the body is moving, if anything comes out from Najasa from the exit of the filth. The author he says, وَيُشَدُّ فَوْقَهَا خِرْقَةٌ مَشْقُوقَةُ الطَّرْفِ كَالْتُبَّانِ تَجْمَعُ أَلْيَتَيْهِ وَمَثَانَتِهِ Okay, so before the shrouds are put on the person, um, a piece of cloth is gotten and it's wrapped around the private parts of the dead person. It's wrapped tightly so that the bottom the rear end and the front end of the person uh, is tight, like a loincloth. If anybody remembers the old loincloths, okay, then this loincloth 
would be wrapped around uh, something like what the sumo wrestlers might wear is wrapped around uh, the buttocks of the dead person and the front private part of the dead person to make it tight so nothing would come out and the hanut which was used on these areas on the shrouding sheets as well as the cotton that we mentioned is going to be put uh, around on the on the buttock cheeks of the dead person then any hanut which is left over any of that mixed perfume which is left over over is to be put on the manafid of the person's face the manafid means like the eyes so the hanut is put on the tops of the eyelids it's also put around the nostrils and in Radul Murbi' it also mentions that as well as the mouth is put on, uh, on the ear lobes also so the reason as we mentioned that this hanut is put in these places as we said is to prevent the vermin from entering these areas uh, which are normally entered into the body okay so any vermin which are found buried into the uh, grave this hanut this strong perfume would help to repel them from entering into the uh, body of the dead person so we said that it's a manafid wajhihi it's put on the areas like the eyes the mouth the, the nose and the ears and also is put mawadi sujudihi the hanut the strong perfume is also put on the places where the body would make prostration like the forehead the nose the hands uh, the knees and the feet the reason it's done is because this is takriman this is out of honor of the places of sujood that this perfume strong smelling perfume is put on those places the author he said وَإِن طُيِّبَ كُلُّهُ فَحَسَنُ if the whole body has perfume put on it then that is something which is well and good why? because in the musannaf of Imam Ibn Abi Shayba and Abd al-Razzaq they collect an ather a narration pertaining to the companions where Ibn Umar كَانَ يُطَيِّبُ الْمَيِّتْ بالمسك يَضُرُّ عَلَيْهِ ذَرُورًا that Ibn Umar radiallahu anhum, anhuma, he used to get misk, the strong smelling perfume, beautiful perfume smell, and he used to put it all over the dead body, okay? And he used to ensure that it was spread thoroughly over the dead body. So this is something which is allowed to do and something which is recommended. ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ طَرْفُ الْلِفَافَةِ الْعُلْيَا عَلَى شِقِّهِ الْأَيْمَنِ وَيُرُدُّ طَرْفُهُ الْآخَرِ مِنْ فَوْقِهِ ثُمَّ ثَانِيَةُ وَثَالِثُ كَذَلِكَ the author he's telling us now how to do the shrouding okay so there's three shrouds that are on the floor one on top of the other so what you do the uppermost shroud you take it the left of it and you wrap it over the right of the body and then you take the right of the shroud and you wrap it over the left of the body then the second shroud which is underneath you take that and you do it the same way you take the left wrap it to the right the right to the left okay and then the one which is at the bottom you do that also you take it you wrap, you wrap it to the right side and then you take the left the right side and you wrap it to the left side so it's like the babies when they're young they're wrapped up okay it's similar to that when a child is very young and it's a cold day you would wrap up the child in that manner you take the sheets and you wrap them one over the other in a systematic way the author he says that which was extra from the material uh, from the sheets after they've covered the whole body that which is extra is then wrapped over the head to ensure that the head is wrapped so the head is wrapped because the head is honored so the head is wrapped with the extra material and when the wrapping has finished when the whole body has been wrapped from the head to the feet then three knots are to be made three knots are to be tied a knot is to be tied around the head a knot is to be tied around the middle of the body and a knot is to be tied around the feet and then when this body is put into the grave when the corpse is put into the grave once it's there then these knots they are opened up so the knots are there to help ensure that the sheets they do not open up whilst the body is being carried okay the body doesn't come out of the sheets the question to yourselves is when we put it into the grave why do we undo the knots which have been tied around the coffin why do we undo the knots which have been tied on the coffin when put into the grave why are these undone طيب. one of the reasons that the ulama they mentioned uh, why these um, knots are undone is because the shrouding is quite tight and it's made even tighter with these three knots 
And so when the body, after a few days, it starts to bloat, if the knots are not undone, then it's going to damage the body. It can cause damage to the body. And also Sheikh Ahmed Khalil, he mentioned that this was from the actions reported of two of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu that when they buried the dead, they would uh, ensure that the knots which were tied around the kafan, around the shroud, were undone when put into the grave. The author, he says, وَإِن كُفِّنَا فِي قَمِيسٍ وَمِئْزَرٍ وَلِفَافَةٍ جَاز If the dead person is wrapped in the following things, in a qamis, a qamis is like um, a thobe that we know of today, okay? A qamis is a long shirt, very loose, uh, quite loose, and it's similar to a thobe uh, that we have today, except that they're not as tight as the thobes that we wear today. So if the person is shrouded in a qamis and a mi'zar, a mi'zar is a wrap which goes around uh, the bottom half of the body, walifafatin, and then a general sheet, jazz, then this is permissible. So those things that we mentioned before, um, so this is how the, uh, it's permissible for the person to be wrapped. So it doesn't have to be wrapped in three shrouds like we mentioned before. As the Prophet Sallallahu was wrapped, it doesn't have to be done that way. The dead body can be uh, made to wear a qamis and it can be made to wear a mi'zar, okay, the wrap around the bottom of the body, and then a lifafa, and then a sheet which goes around the whole body. So this is permissible to do. وَتُكَفَّنُوا الْمَرْأَةُ فِي خَمْسَةِ أَثْوَابِ And the woman, she is to be wrapped in three pieces of clothing. izarin, the bottom wrap, she has to wear the izar, and a khimar, that which covers the head, okay, down to near the breasts. وَقَمِيسِ And a long loose shirt, like a thobe or an abaya. وَلِفَافَتَيْنِ And then top of that, is also two general wraps around the body. So you notice like the woman, she's protected in life, her honor, her beauty is protected in life from being seen. Likewise, in a serious manner, when she is dead, her beauty is also protected as a way of honoring her. Um, so the author, going back to what he just said here, he said, that the woman is to be wrapped in five pieces of clothing. Some of the ulama, they said it was better had the author, he's not said al-mar'atu, meaning woman, it was better had he said untha, meaning female. It was better had he said that the, the female is wrapped in five pieces of clothing, rather than saying the woman is wrapped in five pieces of clothing. Why do you think some of the ulama, they mentioned this? That rather than saying the woman, he should have said the female. The reason the ulama they say this, uh, some of them said this, is because um, you have those who are above puberty, but they're not considered to be women, but they're above, they've passed the age of puberty, so they are jariya, they're young women, then it would also include them, because they are also to be wrapped in the same manner as a woman, as a mature woman. The jariya, the young woman who is under puberty, however, is wrapped in a qamis, Okay, in a loose shirt or a loose thobe like type of clothing and two sheets without a khimar. So the jariya, the one that is under the age of puberty from amongst the females, is wrapped in a qamis and two sheets without a khimar. The khuntha, the hermaphrodite, the khuntha al-mushkila, is wrapped like a woman, ihtiyatan, is treated as a woman out of uh, care in case it was a woman rather than being a man. So it's wrapped like a woman, ihtiyatan. The author, he says, وَالْوَاجِبُ ثَوْبٌ يَسْتُرُ جَمِيعَهُ So everything that we've mentioned previously is mustahab, is recommended in the terms of the man being wrapped in the three sheets, in terms of the woman being wrapped in the five okay, pieces of clothing. Uh, and in terms of the man being, if he was wrapped in a qamis and a, a izar, okay, and then a sheet. So the author, he says here, وَالْوَاجِبُ ثَوْبٌ يَسْتُرُ جَمِيعَهُ However, the wajib, the obligatory thing that must take place, is that the dead person is shrouded in at least one piece of clothing that covers the whole of the body, okay? So if the person, if only found is one sheet, okay, and that covers the whole body of the person, then that is what suffices. And everything before was something which was highly recommended and mustahab. The illa here, the reasoning here, is they say that it's allowed for a person to be covered with one piece of clothing in their life, as long as it covers their aura and that which is essential to be covered. So likewise in death, that would suffice for a person to be covered also in only one piece of clothing, clothing, as long as it covers the whole body. And also, as mentioned by Sheikh Ahmed Khalil, that was how Musab ibn Umair and Hamza radiallahu anhuma were buried with one piece of clothing. A few points to mention 
it's disliked to wrap the dead body, to make a shroud of the dead body in Suf, okay? In Suf. And for the strange reason, it's gone from my mind what the exact translation of Suf is. Let's say Suf is like um, fur, okay? Suf. Suf is not to be wrapped as a shroud for the dead person because the Salaf radiallahu anhum, it was never narrated from the pious predecessors that any of them did this. And some of the ulama, they said that it can be harmful to the body. Okay, so no suf. And also it's haram, it's impermissible to use animal skin. It's impermissible to use animal skin uh, as a shroud. Why? Because the Prophet وسلم, when it came to the shuhada of Uhud, uh, he commanded the people that before he, they were buried, that the julud, that the protective animal skins that they were wearing uh, in battle was to be removed. So animal skin was commanded by the Prophet Sallallahu to be removed from the shuhada, from the martyrs of Uhud. That's why it's impermissible for anyone to be wrapped like that. Silk as a takfin, as a clothing, as a material for shroud is only allowed in, time, in times of necessity. And necessity here is if no other clothing, no other material is found. If no other material is found, then it's permissible to use silk. However, if other material is available or can be found, then silk is not to be used. Another important point to mention, if only enough material or only enough clothing is there to cover the aura, then that's what should be given preference, precedence. The aura is to be covered and that which is left exposed from the rest of the body, leaves and grass etc. etc. can be used to cover uh, the other areas of the body because this is what the Prophet ﷺ did in many cases with many of the shuhada. That the aura is covered and then the rest of the body is covered with leaves and grass if there's not enough material to cover the whole body. The ulama they also mention that when you bury the person, it's imperative that you don't bury the person with jewellery. You don't bury the person with jewellery, okay? So if the person had, for example, uh, jewellery that they were wearing, that, that jewellery is to be taken off. If the person had, for example, even in a situation like he had a, a nose made of gold, then that nose would be removed and then one made of clay or something of that similar nature would be made and replaced uh, for that gold nose. Why, they say? Because this is israf al-mal. This is uh, squandering wealth, which can be used uh, elsewhere for the living. So that's why it's not taken to the grave. Jewelry and valuables of that nature are not taken to the grave. Rather, they're removed and they're given to those who are in need from amongst those who would inherit. The coffin, the, the ulama mentioned also, the coffin, the, the shroud which is put aside for the dead, it can be taken and given to the living. What do we mean here? That the shroud which was donated to the dead person, not if it's purchased from the dead person's own money, so this is not uh, permissible if it's purchased from the dead person's own money. However, if it was purchased from other than the dead person's own money, then if that shroud is later on needed for uh, very poor people, in the sense that there's very poor people in the community who cannot find clothing to shroud themselves, to protect themselves from the cold, the extreme cold or the extreme heat, then the shroud of the dead person can be taken after he's buried and it can be given to these extremely uh, destitute people that need it uh, for their protection in life. Okay, but however, not if it was bought uh, from the dead person's money, because that then belongs to him uh, in every situation. This is all I have to mention in this particular section. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were for myself and shaitan. If you have any questions quickly on the topic, then feel free. Otherwise, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward us immensely. Ameen. Wa jazakumullah khair.